Well, hello again, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second lecture of the third unit. This is Human Genetic Disorders, Part 2. And what we're going to be talking about today is first just dominant traits in general, making sure that we're comfortable with the Mendelian definition and Mendelian pr principle of dominant traits. And then we'll move on to our examples of human disorders that are dominant. So first will be Huntington's disease, and then will also allow us to have a brief conversation on a genetic phenomenon called anticipation. Then we'll move on to a chondroplastic dwarfism. I do hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And we'll end with Down syndrome. Now, technically, Down syndrome isn't a genetically dominant disorder, but it is due to one aberrant chromosome. So if it's going to fall into any of the categories that we're talking about here in this unit, this is the best lecture for it to be discussed. But before we go into any of those diseases, let's go all the way back to our brown hair pigment making factory that we introduced at the beginning of the last lecture. To remind you, you own a factory and your factory makes brown hair color and you have two spots on your factory floor for the machine or machines that make that brown hair pigmentation and these are the two machines. Now again think to yourself as before how many brown pigment machines do you actually need working of these two in order to make brown hair? And of course the answer is only one. If both of these machines make brown pigment then the factory is making brown pigment if one of these machines is working, the other is working, or they're both working. In fact, the only time we can't make that pigment is if both machines are simultaneously broken. And again, if we think of these machines as enzymes and the instructions for making them as alleles of specific genes, then in order to have that brown hair, in order to make that brown pigment, we actually only need one functional allele encoding one functional enzyme. So congratulations again. You now fully understand all of basic Mendelian genetics through that one example, and more importantly for this lecture, you understand the principle of dominance. Dominant traits are dominant because they require only one functional allele. Brown hair is dominant for this very reason. Either of those alleles working or both of those alleles working allow the cell to make the brown pigment only if both of those alleles are mutant and no functional enzyme can be made do we actually have the recessive trait. Now what's interesting about this lecture is that we're talking about dominant disorders where the disorder itself is dominant and what that means is that the mutant allele that causes the syndrome is itself actually the more powerful allele or to say it more in a molecular genetics way it encodes the stronger more powerful protein and we'll see examples of that as we go along so again in the context of this analogy the brown haired making machine is the enzyme the instructions for building that enzyme is what's encoded by a gene and different versions of those instructions or different versions of those genes are alleles some of those alleles encode enzymes that work some of those alleles encode enzymes that don't Sometimes we can have the function, sometimes we can't, and that's where we have our dominance. Now, congratulations again, because this is actually the bridge between Mendelian genetics and molecular genetics, this idea of thinking of traits as the outcome of enzymes, right? And, and we even stick a toe in biochemistry that way as well. So alleles encode enzymes or proteins, proteins and enzymes manifest traits, and it's those traits that are governed by the very alleles that encoded them. All right, so with that in our back pocket and a, and a relative comfort with Mendelian dominance, let's talk about Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease, or more officially known as Huntington's chorea, strikes about 0.01% of people, or one in every 10,000. Symptoms are usually motor oriented and they start as arm jerks and twitches and then basically progress and get worse to facial twitches, tremors, and then spreads to other parts of the body. Ultimately, we can develop into full writhing. These symptoms, obviously, are becoming increasingly more debilitating and interfere more and more with voluntary movement. So speaking, feeding oneself, walking, basically anything that we control with thought becomes harder and harder to do as Huntington's progresses. The ability to learn new movements is even harder, so it's very difficult for people experiencing Huntington's disease to pick up new motor skills. And Huntington's disease is also associated with gradual, but ultimately extensive brain damage. We can see that here in these cross sections, the individual who donated the brain on the right uh, was free of neuronal disorders, free of Huntington's disease, and the brain on the left is from a Huntington's patient. And you can notice large amounts of gross changes here, wide-scale changes. Uh, the ventricles, the, the hollow parts in the center, are much, much longer. 
the amount of white matter, that's the myelinated region of the brain, where the axons are developed and fully insulated by fatty sheaths, much, much less white matter. White matter is a good example of brain health and much more gray matter indicative of the cell struggling to remain healthy. So massive anomalies in the Huntington's brain due to this disorder. And perhaps not surprisingly, patients with Huntington's disease also de develop psychological disorders. These can include depression, memory impairment, high levels of anxiety, hallucinations and delusions. They exhibit poor judgment. They even can uh, start to abuse chemicals of abuse, such as drug and alcohol. And sexual disorders, all the way from a complete lack of sexual responsiveness to uh, atypical, uncharacteristic promiscuity. Uh, so personality changes across the scope of the individual. And actually, it's quite common for these psychological disorders to surface before the motor disorders do. And oftentimes, it's not uncommon for someone with early stage Huntington's to actually be initially diagnosed with schizophrenia because the psychological manifestations arise before the physical ones do. Huntington's usually has symptom onset between the ages of 30 and 50, but there's a very wide range of age of onset uh, where individuals can develop Huntington's from childhood all the way into uh, the elderly years. And also, perhaps not surprisingly, the earlier the onset, the more rapid the symptoms worsen and the more rapid the deterioration. But Regardless of when symptoms first emerge, when they do, they ultimately do get progressively worse and most individuals will die of this disorder due to the neurological damage that we saw in those brains. So far there's no treatment for Huntington's, but by using mouse models we can see evidence that we can slow the effects of the symptoms by enriching and, and overstimulating the environment. So by having the brain used more we can delay the progression of this disorder to some extent. And because we, we have it here in this lecture, so it's not a surprise, it is a dominant disorder. So you need only one mutant allele in order to have Huntington's. Therefore, from a Mendelian genetics point of view, uh, people that have parents with Huntington's are at a significantly increased risk for developing the disease later in life because even if that parent is heterozygote, there's a 50% chance that that mutant allele was inherited. There now exists a pre-symptomatic test that can spot that mutant allele and reliably identify that it's present and therefore diagnose the risk of Huntington's prior to any symptoms coming on. But perhaps not surprisingly, many people with Huntington's parents choose not to get this test, you know, in the sense that it's much better to be ignorant. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen anyway. And many, many people would rather not know that this lies in their future. So let's talk about the disorder uh, from a genetics perspective and, and really try to understand what's going on and why it's dominant. So it's, it's a fairly unique disease in that uh, it's due to what's called expanding nucleotide repeats. The gene that causes Huntington's, which the gene's name is Huntington, T-I-N, Huntington, I guess is the best way to say it. There's a particular part of that gene with this trinucleotide repeat, C-A-G. So it's just cytosine, adenine, guanine many, many times in a row. In healthy people, the number of repeats is somewhere between 11 and 24 repeats. Actually, up to 35 repeats of this CAG trinucleotide results in no Huntington's disease and, and no symptoms. But 35 really is the high end of normalcy. Once you hit 36 repeats, you're at risk for Huntington's. Uh, so individuals with 36 to 38 of these CAG repeats have high risk of Huntington's, but typically not until a much, much older age. And here we see just what we mean by expanding nucleotide repeat. All that's changing is the number of these CAGs. Uh, these islands of repeated repetitive sequences are quite common in our genome, although they're not very common in genes. For those of you that have interests in forensic biology, the, the entire premise of a DNA fingerprint is actually built on looking at repeated sequences such as these across our entire genome. The number of repeats that individuals have at multiple spots or loci of their genome, not in protein coding genes, but just in the junk DNA of our genome, is um, discriminatory. I mean, we can tell each other apart from a statistical average of one in about four trillion just by looking at our number of repeats in about 13 to 16 different areas. Anyway, back to Huntington's. People with 39 or more repeats are likely to developing Huntington's period, 
unless they prematurely die of, of something else. So from 39 on, they will likely have Huntington's and not die of old age earlier. And interestingly, as far as I know, this is the only common genetic disorder where this is the case. The more repeats over 39, the earlier and earlier Huntington's will onset. And so physicians and genetic counselors can actually give patients a fairly reliable estimation of when symptoms will emerge simply based on the number of CAG, CAG repeats in this Huntington gene. And we see that here. So on the x-axis, we have the number of repeats. And on the y, we have the mean age of onset. And you can see an individual with 50 repeats will probably, likely, get Huntington's disease or show the initial symptoms in their 30s, whereas people with 40 repeats will likely uh, live until they're around 60 before they begin to experience symptoms. So the, the age of onset of the early symptoms of Huntington's is directly correlated to the number of repeats, CAG repeats in that gene. And Huntington's is not unique in that expanded nucleotide repeats is causing the disorder. This does factor into other neurological diseases as well. They're just not as common. So we see Huntington's there on the graph, but we also have spinal and bulbar muscular dystrophy. Uh, another dystrophy that I won't even attempt to pronounce, uh, Mikado Joseph disease. So these are very rare neurological disorders, but they're all due to expanding nucleotide repeats. And all of them show the same pattern as Huntington's, whereas the greater the number of repeats, the earlier the age of onset. So it's always the case. More repeats is worse. And there's a reason for that. Also note, though, there's a wide range of outcomes, even with this genetic component. So individuals, for example, with 48 repeats have an age, uh, average age of onset of about 30. We saw that in the graph. Uh, but individuals can have symptoms from as early as 20 to as late as 40. So that 30 is just the mean age of onset. Still, two individuals with the same exact number of repeats can develop symptoms at very different times of their life because other factors are at play. So there's clearly a very strong genetic component to Huntington's, but because of this wide variability in the age of onset, there's also clearly other factors at work as well. And what these factors are specifically, we don't know, but they must be other genes, environmental factors, in other words, other things that make individuals different and unique from one another besides and beyond the number of repeats in that one gene. So the gene Huntington encodes a protein by the same name, and this protein is made throughout the body. But interestingly, the mutant form of the protein with these expanded repeats seems to only cause a problem in the brain. Uh, this protein seems to be harmless to all other cell types. And of course, you've probably realized it already, but we have an expanding trinucleotide repeat. Well, a trinucleotide is a codon, so really we're adding more and more CAG amino acids to the protein. We're increasing the size of the protein, and we're adding more and more um, amino acids to the center of that protein. So what's going on here is that these additional amino acids are causing the Huntington protein to unfold partially. And due to that unfolding, this mutant protein aggregates and it clusters uh, into clumps or plaques inside the brain. And it actually impairs the mitochondria of those neurons. So this is what healthy cells should appear to be. Uh, Huntington protein is here in green. And we see that it is nice and diffuse across the entire cell. And then here is a cell with that mutant Huntington protein being expressed. And we see these very, very bright clusters of GFP, of green fluorescent protein. That's what's tagging this Huntington protein. And those bright clusters are these aggregated clumps, these proteins that have uh, collected in these isolated areas. And because they're aggregating and clumping, they're falling out of solution, they're precipitating out of solution, and they're creating damage to the cell. So this is what leads to the symptomology. Additionally, as these proteins clump up, they trap other molecules within the clumps. We see that on the panel on the left here. We've got normal Huntington protein on the left, and it's aggregating on the right. But as it's aggregating, it's sequestering and collecting these other molecules and disrupting cellular function because of that. Uh, and then on the right, we see that if we're under 35 repeats, the normal protein results in a nor normal neuron. But as we increase those repeats, the protein gets larger. That alters the protein structure, 
it expands these hydrophobic regions in the in the protein exposes them to the outside environment and the only way for these hydrophobic exposed regions to exclude themselves from water is to have mutant proteins cluster together so the hydrophobic patches of proteins are clustering together to exclude water and that's what's creating the aggregates that trap these molecules so that leads us to a little side discussion of protein folding. In many ways, protein folding deserves its own upper-level elective. How proteins fold is remarkably interesting. But we'll just cover it in a few brief minutes here so that we understand protein folding in the context of this disease. For proteins, the amino acid sequence, what biochemists would call the primary structure, is what directly determines the overall shape of the fully folded protein and its tertiary structure. And in that way, structure equals function, right? Proteins have the job that they have, and they do the processes that they do because of the three-dimensional shape that they take. And to expand the notion of structure equals function to a molecular geneticist like me, uh, we like to think of it as sequence equals structure equals function. So it's the sequence of the gene that dictates the sequence of the amino acids in the protein, and that sequence of amino acids causes that protein to fold in a particular way, and that folding gives that protein its function. So sequence equals structure, and structure equals function. So it is the primary sequence of the amino acid that directly drives the overall folding of that protein into the shape that gives it its job. But even with that direct relationship between amino acid sequence and folding, we're still not very good at predicting the three-dimensional shape of a protein given only its amino acid sequence. It's a very, very complicated process with a lot of energetics and a lot of variables, a lot of moving parts. And biochemistry even now is just scratching the surface of protein shape prediction from sequence alone. What we do know though, and we've known it for a long time, is that the largest contributor to protein folding is hydrophobicity. Those hydrophobic nonpolar side chains of the amino acids that are themselves hydrophobic are trying to get themselves away from the watery environment of the cytoplasm. And the only way for them to do that is to sequester themselves into the interior of the protein. So the hydrophobic nonpolar side chains of amino acids rush and fold to be in the center of the protein, whereas the hydrophilic polar amino acid ch side chains are comfortable and happy being on the exterior of the protein, and that drives the overall folding of the protein. So hydrophobics go to inside, hydrophilics stay outside, and the protein begins to fold in its three-dimensional shape. Please note, and I think we've made this point before, there's no such thing really as a hydrophobic interaction. Sometimes hydrophobic things will engage in van der Waals interactions, but for the most part, the hydrophobic things aren't really interacting with each other. They're just excluding one another for water. By hydrophobic things getting very close together, they squeeze water out, and that's what's important. So if we look at this kind of silly, brief, simple schematic of protein folding, we've got the primary structure of the amino acids here, all linear. Here's the amino terminal end, the carboxy terminal end, and the chain of amino acids in the middle. And some of these hydrophobic amino acids lie along this chain, and those are the amino acids that will drive towards the interior of the protein, this region here. And the hydrophilic amino acids with side chains that are charged, partially or fully, those are the amino acids that will comfortably go to the exterior of the protein and happily interact with water. And that drives protein folding. So proteins will fold, usually all by themselves. Sometimes they need chaperones or other proteins to help them. But they'll fold in such a way to sequester those hydrophobic amino acids to the interior and allow the hydrophilics to stay outside. So correct protein folding is certainly critical to the functioning of the protein, and the correct function of the protein is needed for the viability of the organism. So this is a critical process. Fold, proteins need to fold properly. And lots of disorders, especially neurological disorders, are actually due at their core to improper protein folding. Mad cow's disease, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and of course Huntington's are all due to mutant proteins folding improperly, and due to that improper folding, hydrophobic residues are exposed on the exterior. And to sequester water away from those hydrophobic pockets, those proteins clump up and aggregate. And in that clumping, they create cellular damage. So what we see here is kind of the essence of the aggregation. In the interior of the protein are the hydrophobic amino acids. And when the protein is correctly folded, those hydrophobic amino acids are in the center. But when the protein unfolds, we expose those hydrophobic amino acids. So here's one right here. 
it will track it. It's right here, hydrophobic. Now it's exposed, and the only way to sequester water is for another mutant unfolded protein to aggregate with the first. We can't have water trying to interact with hydrophobic residues. It's just entropy won't allow it. So in order to increase randomness and decrease the energetics, hydrophobic things will spontaneously associate. And these partially unfolded mutant Huntington proteins will associate with one another when misfolded to get those hydrophobic residues away from water. And when they do so, those proteins don't function properly, insoluble clumps are formed, we trap important molecules, and the disorder will manifest. So while it's true that for much of the proteins that are wild type and functional, pro pro uh, proper protein folding is done based on the sequences that those proteins contain in their primary structure, proteins don't always fold up properly on their own. Again, sometimes they need chaperones to help them. These are wild type proteins, non-mutated, but the complexity of their folding is so high that these additional chaperone proteins are needed to uh, maintain the proper folding and make sure these proteins fold into their proper what's called native configuration. So back to Huntington's disease with this improper folding, this clumping and aggregation, uh, this trapping of molecules, small molecules that the cell needs to survive, we see some of the symptomology within the cell that explains some of what we see as the symptoms of Huntington's as a disease. Uh, one of those things is that Huntington's affected cells often fail to release a neurotrophin, BDNF. Uh, neurotrophins help neurons survive and to trigger neurons around them to survive. Uh, often this BDNF is secreted near or within the synapse, and so postsynaptic cells do not live, do not get the signals to continue living uh, where they would have otherwise been unaffected if BDNF wasn't sequestered by these, these aggregate clumps. So based on all of this, an obvious therapeutic for Huntington's would be to block the aggregation, to somehow create a small molecule inhibitor that stops uh, the Huntington, the mutant Huntington protein from aggregating with others and stops these clumps from falling. And sure enough, that is some of the drugs that are showing the most promise right now. These aggregation blocking drugs are some of the most promising. Uh, these drugs have shown to stop the mutant Huntington protein from either being made or aggregating with others. So far, these drugs have worked somewhat well in model systems and animal systems. That doesn't necessarily mean they'll work well in humans as well. There have been plenty of stories of drugs that work well in mice and don't translate to humans. And adding to that cautious optimism, some of those aggregation blocking drugs seem to be working well in some mammalian model organisms, but not others. Uh, so they'll work well in mice, but not in primates, for example. So that's usually a sign that they might not work all that well in humans. That said, even though these specific compounds might not be showing the kind of promise one hopes for, the overall idea and strategy of blocking the production and or aggregation of mutant Huntington is currently the, the most widely explored strategy for getting a therapeutic that can combat this disease. Also, in the grander scope, this story of Huntington's chorea illustrates that impairing the brain's ability to control movement has disastrous consequences and will ultimately lead to death. So this complicated diagram does a wonderful job of summing up all that we know about Huntington's uh, and all that was shared in this lecture. So here is the Huntington's protein being made. Uh, this is the protein, the mutant protein that's being created, and some of that protein will go into the nucleus. In the nucleus, if that mutant protein aggregates, it can trap some of these uh, nuclear proteins and nuclear small molecules and disrupt the function of the nucleus. So this intranuclear inclusion, this is an aggregate of Huntington within the nucleus that is trapping other small molecules and proteins within it. And because of those molecules and proteins being sequestered in a Huntington clump, they, there are some genes that are misregulated. And misregulated genes lead to misregulated proteins. And of course, that's going to change the cellular physiology. So that's a nuclear arm of manifestation from this. Within the cytoplasm, uh, sometimes we get proteotic cleavage of the, the native Huntington protein, and those cleavage products can become aggregate if they're mutant. And again, aggregation this time in the cytoplasm is going to create an inclusion, this trapping aggregate where small molecules and other proteins are trapped. And these molecules being trapped are going to impair some of the other proteins and the networks of proteins that are required for proper cellular physiology.
that might block transport of proteins down the axon that might block synaptic dysfunction we mentioned earlier there's mitochondrial impairment with Huntington so a wide ranging effect of cytoplasmic processes due to these inclusions now if we have uh, rampant Huntington's and we have inclusions both in the nucleus and the cytoplasm that often is going to lead to cell death uh, and cause some of those very wide ranging uh, morphological effects in the brain so as I said at the beginning of the lecture, Huntington's is also a good case study on this uh, phenomenon, genetic phenomenon called anticipation. Anticipation is when a trait is more strongly expressed or, I should say, and or expressed earlier in life with each subsequent generation. So we can see that in these two different graphs here. Here in the grandparent, there was a late age of onset of the disease. In the parent, the age was earlier. In the grandchild, the age is earlier still. That's anticipation. The disease is manifesting at earlier and earlier ages. Or, in the grandparent, it was a mild disorder. In the parent, it was moderate. And in the grandchild, it's severe. And like I said, this is an and or. So we can have it being earlier and more severe in the parent and earlier still and more severe still in the grandchild. So anticipation is essentially when the disorder gets worse with subsequent generations. And part of the reason why we see that in Huntington's chorea is because these nucleotides can expand in each subsequent generation. Nucleotide expansion on nucleotide repeats is actually due to uh, something called replication slippage where the new strand will disassociate from the template strand during DNA replication, and when it reanneals, it reanneals improperly, and therefore we get a greater and greater expansion of these nucleotide repeats. So the more opportunities we have for replication slippage, the more opportunities we have for nucleotide expansion, so with more and more generations, we get more and more expansion. So again, Huntington's is a classic example of this anticipation. There's a lot more that goes into anticipation that we don't un understand genetically or biochemically. We're just scratching the surface on understanding antici anticipation as a phenomenon. But uh, again, an interesting example of it here in Huntington's. So moving on then to achondroplastic dwarfism. This is also a classically dominant disorder. Again, we only need one allele in order to show the disorder. Uh, so an individual that is heterozygote for a chondroplastic dwarfism will show the phenotype of the disorder. It's due to a mutation in a gene called FGFR3, and this gene encodes proteins that are involved in the growth and maintenance of bone. So a mutation in this gene causes proteins to be overactive. That's why it's dominant. Remember, if this was a loss of function mutation, if this was an underactive enzyme, then a wild type allele would be dominant to it. The problem here is that the mutation is overactive. The problem with Huntington's is that that one mutant allele makes proteins that will form aggregates. You only need one allele to have the outcome. That's what makes it dominant because that one mutant allele, that one mutant protein causes the, the, the uh, dysregulation or dimorphism of the cellular physiology. So in this case, the overactive enzyme uh, causes bone, bone growth and skeletal development to be uh, atypical. So here's a, a family that has the achondroplastic uh, dwarfism. Affects about one in every 15,000 individuals. About one in 40,000 babies born each year have this disorder. It uh, shows no distinction or prevalence in any race or sex. It's, it's got an, a fairly equal distribution in all races and sexes, and it is considered a rare disease with less than 200,000 people in the United States living with it. It can be diagnosed uh, phenotypically by prenatal ultrasound. Uh, if there's excess amniotic fluid, that's often an indicator that this is uh, happening. If there's an increased front to back head size, uh, also indicative of hydrocephalus, water on the brain, that's also an indicator of this disorder. And x-rays, even infant x-rays of the long bones, can show the, this kind of characteristic bowing and stunting of the long bones of the leg, also a characteristic hallmark of a, a chondroplastic dwarfism. Symptoms do include bowed legs, a disproportionate head-to-body ratio, prominent forehead, uh, shortened arms and legs, and a relatively short stature. As far as life expectancy goes, for someone who's heterozygous that only has one mutant allele, well, they'll show the morphological uh, 
phenotype of this disorder, but their life expectancy is almost normal. Generally, it's only about 10 years or, or so less than average. However, individuals that are homozygous for the mutant allele, this is generally a much more severe bone uh, pathology, and it can cause lethal deformities, deformities, usually in the rib cage, and individuals with the homozygous dominant alleles uh, usually don't survive much past their infant years. There's little to no treatment options available, and current research as far as therapeutics go is minimal because it is a rare disease. It affects so few people, there's, there's not a market for treatments, to be quite blunt about it, and pharmaceutical companies don't really explore rare diseases because there's not much of a margin for profit there. Small profit incentive usually means little research and development, as heartless as that might sound. And then finally, Down syndrome. This is a neurodevelopmental syndrome that was named after the individual who first characterized it. His name was John Langdon Haddon Down. He first described the physical and behavioral characteristics of Down syndrome in 1862. In 1958, Jerome Legue and his team identified Down syndrome as being due to trisomy 21, a third chromosome 21. And interestingly, this wasn't long after we learned the actual genetic number of chromosomes to be 46 in our genome. So what you're seeing here is a normal karyotype of a healthy male. We've got 46 total chromosomes, 22 homologous pairs for 44 chromosomes there, and then the sex chromosomes make up the, the last 23rd pair, the chromosome number 45 and 46. This is a male we see because we have one X chromosome and one Y, and of course a female would have two X's in that location. Trisomy 21 is just that. It's trisomy of chromosome number 21. So instead of having two chromosome 21s, we have three, and that extra chromosome leads to the disorder. It creates an imbalance of gene products, and the only reason why this is tolerated and survivable is because chromosome 21 is so small and has such a small gene number relative to the other chromosomes that it's the only chromosomal imbalance that will, well, one of the only that will tolerate. There's also a disorder called Patau syndrome, which is trisomy 18. So again, uh, Lejeune discovered down syndrome to be to trisomy 21 only two years after it was discovered by the field of biology that we have 46 chromosomes typically. So about 90 to 95 percent of trisomy 21 is due to what's referred to as a non-disjunction event in the maternal oocyte, in the mother's egg during meiosis. Uh, I'm, I'm relatively certain you've learned about this in other genetics classes, but to review it very brief, briefly, there are two broad stages in meiosis, meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. In meiosis 1, we separate homologous chromosomes from one another. This is the divisional, um, uh, or I should say the reductive division, where we have the chromosome number from 46 to 23. And then meiosis 2 is the equational division where we go from 23 chromosomes to 23 chromosomes, but that's because we're separating sister chromatids. It's possible to have a non-disjunction event in either stage of meiosis. We can have a non-disjunction event where we get all four sister chromatids to one daughter cell, and in that case we're going to have a plus one in two different oocytes. Uh, if this extra chromosome is chromosome 21, this fertilized oocyte will give rise to Down syndrome. Or we can have a non-disjunction event in meiosis 2, where the two sister chromatids go to one side, and the other uh, oocyte gets uh, no chromosome for that number. In this case, these chromosomes, or I should say oocytes, that are deprived of a chromosome will die, uh, but those that have the additional chromosome can survive and be fertilized if that is a non-disjunction event of chromosome 21. Most Down syndrome is caused by a non-disjunction event in meiosis 2, specifically, but it is possible, again, for there to be non-disjunction in meiosis 1. So 90 to 95% of Down syndrome is due to that, to a classic non-disjunction event as diagrammed here. Another 2 to 4% is due to a translocation event. Translocation is when pieces of chromosomes swap places with one another. And a very specific translocation called a Philadelphia translocation can actually result in one chromosome being added to another. So this is a, a Philadelphia translocation of chromosome 14 and 21. And we see that as a result of the translocation, chromosome 14 loses, loses just a little bit from its short arm, and chromosome 21 loses a little bit of its short arm. These small pieces of chromosomal DNA are so small, they're actually recycled, 
but the end result is this hybrid chromosome, which is actually most of chromosome 14 and most of chromosome 21. So an individual that has this chromosome arrangement, they have two chromosome 14s and two normal chromosome 21s. If they have this chromosome 14 here, then they actually have three variations of chromosome 21 information. They'll have the mother's chromosome 21, the father's chromosome 21, and this translocated chromosome 14, which has a third copy of chromosome 21 information. And that's going to lead to Down syndrome. Now, these Philadelphia translocations, or Robertsonian translocation here, because it's specific to chromosome 21, but this general fusing of two chromosomes together as a Philadelphia translocation, these are very, very rare. And so, again, uh, this is why we believe that... Um, uh, or know that only 2 to 4% of Down syndrome is due to this. I'll also note that the chromosome number between us and our closest evolutionary related relationship, but chimpanzees, is different. We have 46 chromosomes and chimpanzees have 48. But it's been proven now that that's due to a Philadelphia translocation of two small chromosomes in chimps fusing to become one large chromosome in humans. And so the actual DNA similarity between chimps and humans is over 98%. But our chromosome number is different because we have some of these fusion chromosomes in our genomes uh, that chimps still have as smaller independent chromosomes. The last 2 to 4% of Down syndrome is due to something called moiasism. Uh, this is a non-disjunction event that occurs in the fertilized zygote in the egg. So what happens is there's actually a twin splitting here. So we we get uh, an egg with 23 chromosomes that is healthy and normal, sperm with 23 chromosomes that's healthy and normal, 46 chromosomes in the fertilized egg, and then we're going to go into the first cellular division. So 46 chromosomes will be replicated into 92, and then we'll go through mitosis and we have two daughter cells with 46 chromosomes. This is the two cell stage of the zygote. Those two cells are fused. Now, if these two cells separate in a normal and healthy individual, we've just given rise to identical twins. Those are genetic clones of one another, but they will develop as two separate individuals, uh, two separate embryos. And that's what's happened here. We've had a twinning of these two cells. So we have 46 chromosomes in each independent cell. One cell is going to continue to develop normally. So 46 chromosomes replicated to 92, mitosis down to 46. 92, mitosis 46, so that's normal development. In the other cell, 46 chromosomes will be replicated into 92, but right here we get a non-disjunction event in this mitosis, not this meiosis. One of these cells gets 47 chromosomes, that extra chromosome being an extra chromosome 21, and the other cell gets 45. No cell with 45 chromosomes is viable, so this cell is going to die, but this will continue to develop as an individual that has, after DNA replication, 94 chromosomes, and then they split to 47 in each cell, and that will continue. This individual will have Down syndrome. So in this case, you do have identical twins, identical in every way except one of those twins has an extra chromosome 21 due to that uh, non-disjunction event here after the twinning. Uh, very, very interesting in that these two individuals are genetically identical, but one has Down syndrome and the other doesn't, because one of those cells had a non-disjunction event and the other did not. Uh, interestingly, a neighbor of ours across the street has twins, one of which has Down syndrome. And, um, you know, upon researching this for the course, I'm quite curious if that's due to moiasism and if it's possible that those two twins are truly genetic clones. They're monozygotic twins, uh, but due to this non-disjunction kind of event, perhaps one of those twins developed Down. So as far as symptoms go, about 40 to 60 percent of individuals with Down syndrome also have uh, abnormal hearts, so cardiac effects. It's very common for there to be um, abnormalities with the eyes, such as cataracts, glaucoma, nearsightedness. Five percent of individuals have cataracts, one percent have glaucoma, but nearsightedness is very, very common. So it's very typical to see those with Down syndrome to have glasses for reading uh, and for, for seeing. Often there's hearing loss. About 30 to 75 percent of individuals with Down syndrome will have some hearing loss by preschool. Low thyroidism is quite common. About 30 percent will have that by the time that they're 25 years old. Celiac disease, uh, wheat allergy is quite common as well, as is immune dysfunction. 
Uh, autoimmune disorders are common. Cancer of the immune cells, leukemia, cancer of the white blood cells is, is a higher incidence in individuals with Down syndrome. And there are neurological uh, effects as well. Seizures are experienced by 8 to 50% of individuals with Down at least by the time that they're 50 years old. And sleep apnea is also a common symptom. And the characteristic symptom that we all know Downs to be are developmental delays and learning differences that are experienced by individuals with trisomy 21. So that is the material that we're covering here for dominant disorders. Again, Huntington's disease is our first example of a dominant disorder striking about 1 in 10,000 people, at least here in the United States. It's characterized by motor symptoms, a, a gradual onset of these symptoms, but those become more progressive with age, resulting in extensive brain damage and ultimately fatality if the individual lives long enough. It's due to a single dominant allele, and that dominant allele has a high, unusual, and abnormal number of CAG repeats. In healthy people, these repeats are uh, found about 11 to 24 times, up to 35 repeats, and there's a very, very low risk for Huntington's. But once we get to that 36th repeat, that risk for Huntington's becomes significant. People with 39 or more repeats are very likely to develop the disease. And again, with the higher number of repeats comes an earlier and earlier age of onset. The cause of the disorder is these protein aggregates. So these expanded nucleotide repeats result in longer proteins. These longer proteins misfold and expose hydrophobic patches. And in order to exclude water from those hydrophobic patches, these mutant proteins aggregate. They can do that in the nucleus or the cytoplasm. And by aggregating, uh, they create insoluble clumps or plaques, which can damage the cell. And they trap other proteins and factors that are needed for proper cell function. Uh, it's very common to see mitochondrial impairment, but as we talked about in that uh, portion of the lecture, impairing many, many other cellular functions as well. Huntington's disease is a, a very good example of anticipation, and that is where a trait either comes on more strongly and dramatically with subsequent generations, it, or and or is expressed earlier in life with subsequent generations. So the grandchild has it earlier and or worse than the parent and the grandparent. That's anticipation. We touched on achondroplastic dwarfism as another classic dominant trait. It's due to a mutation in the FGRF3 gene, a gene needed for proper bone development and maintenance. Uh, again, having one mutant allele of this overactive enzyme is all you need for the phenotype. That's what makes it dominant. Individuals with one mutant allele make it to a very late age. They have the characteristic hallmarks and symptoms of an individual with dwarfism, uh, but they don't have much of a change in life expectancy. Individuals with two dominant alleles, homozygous dominant, often don't survive past infancy. The heterozygotic condition affects one in about every 15,000 to one in every 40,000 babies born each year, making it a rare disease. And again, quite severe and early lethality with homozygosity. And we ended with trisomy 21, uh, Down syndrome. Now again, this isn't a classic Mendelian dominant disorder because it's not caused by one allele. But it falls into this category because it is just one extra chromosome that's all you need in order to have the, the manifestation of Down syndrome. Due to, a, uh, due to typically a non-disjunction event, either a non-disjunction event in meiosis leading to a, a, a haploid gamete that has one extra chromosome, or much more rarely a non-disjunction event in one cell of a twin that results in one of those two twins having Down syndrome. That's the moiasism. Uh, another rare cause are these very rare and atypical translocations where chromosome 21 will actually fuse itself to another chromosome, creating a hybrid chromosome that is inclusive of chromosome 21. The symptoms of Down syndrome are systemic, and there is no known cure. Minimal physiological treatment, really, we just treat symptoms. We treat the heart disorder, the low thyroid, the nearsightedness. So we treat the individual pathologies of Down syndrome, but there's no treatment for Down syndrome itself as a disorder. So that's the end of lecture eight. We will close out the course with the next lecture, uh, and that will be us discussing genetic disorders that don't fit neatly into the box of dominant or recessive, but manifest in unique ways. And then we'll discuss some of the 
fairly unique and interesting genetic strategies for studying such disorders and learning the extent to which the genetics plays a role. So until then, thanks for watching, and I uh, can't wait to discuss this with you all a little bit more in depth on Friday.